My name is Ray Boswell. I'm a, a resident of Worcester. I've been living in Worcester for almost uh, 27 years. I've been involved with the uh, John H. Chapey Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Guard for almost 13 years. And I came on board in, I believe, 1993. I'm not keeping track of time because this has been a part-time job for me, which I thoroughly enjoy doing. And uh, this is a subject tonight that I talked about with Ken Ethier. I don't see him tonight, but I presented a, a program about, I think about two or three years ago for the Auburn Historical Society. And we had about 200 people, uh, not 200, we had about 100 people that night. And to be honest with you, I had the flu that night, so I wasn't very, very well uh, active that night. And Ken invited me to talk to uh, Tractor Club about a year later. Believe it or not, I came down with a flu that night, too. So maybe it's a blessing that he's not here, otherwise it would have. But the Blackstone Canal has been a passion with mine since I was a, a student in college down in South Dartmouth that uh, what used to be called the uh, Southeast Massachusetts Institute of Technology, now uh, UMass Dartmouth. And I really didn't understand too much about it and until I moved up this way and, let me see it. Probably in 1978, so it's been a long time since I've been up here, and, and since then I went to uh, Assumption College, Worcester State College, and graduated Worcester State College with a master's degree, and I became very active with the Park Service, and I started to learn a lot about local history. And I've always been amazed about uh, Central Massachusetts history and Rhode Island history and uh, Southeastern Massachusetts history, primarily due to labor people who worked in the mills and the unions and, and technology that has uh, evolved over the last uh, 250 years. As you can see, and, and I know that in the last couple of years that Auburn has tried to get into National Heritage Card. Mm -hmm. And I uh, pursued this a couple of years ago when I was here stating that what you people need to do is get in touch with your politicians, uh, your elected officials officials, your senators, to uh, petition them and uh, suggest that you really get into the National Heritage Card. And hopefully in the next couple of years that may happen. But as you can see, since this slide was produced, the entire section of Worcester right here has been evolved into the Heritage Card. And this section here is Auburn. And you do see this part is the uh, the watershed that is rightfully in the Blackstone Valley. But what we're talking about tonight is the old Blackstone Canal. And I don't know how many of you ever worked in Worcester. I am assuming, and I may be wrong now, that you grew up in Worcester, and as you prospered in your life, you moved out to the suburbs. This is where it all began. This is Slater's Mill. This is pre- 1876, where the Industrial Revolution of America began, okay? This is, this is the site where thread was produced by young women. This is where the American Industrial Revolution began, right here. The format of the American uh, business. Again, this is a uh, different shot, uh, I mean a different photograph of it, but this is Slater Mills here. This house here, the brick building here, is the Wilkerson Mill, which houses a lot of material uh, produced up in this area, mainly machine parts, machinery uh, that was designed to make the, the Industrial Revolution happen. Okay. There's a lot. Go ahead. This is Pawtucket, Rhode Island. I'm sorry. I, I assume that everybody knew what Slater Mill is. I shouldn't do that. But this is Pawtucket, Rhode Island. This is the mouth of uh, uh, the Blackstone River. It's on the uh, Seacant River side. And this is where the blackish water, this area here is fresh water, and just about 100 yards down is salt water. So it's a mixture of salt and uh, fresh water. But this was an easy river to dam up, as you can see the dam here, and this was an easy area to produce uh, water power. So this is why Samuel Slater back in the 1876, wanted to uh, build the first mill here. And this was the first successful mill 
spinning mill in the United States. So from here, the Blackstone Valley was populated from. So every mile or wherever there was a fall, a drop in the water, where we could produce water power by a water wheel, that's where mills were set up. Okay. And of course, you have, you know, if you look at it, you have drops in the water over here too. On the other side of Auburn, you have little drops of water. So you do have a lot of uh, industry still, uh, not still, but uh, back in the 18, early 1800s, still in Auburn. Okay. When we take a look at the Blackstone Valley, when it was first settled, most of the region was industrial farming. Family farming, you know, if you really look at this site, and you're going to tell me if anybody knows history, will say, hey, Ray, this ain't the Blackstone Valley. Can anybody guess where this is? Plymouth Plantation. You're correct. You're correct. You're right. This slide is about ready to go, so I probably won't use this too much anymore. But this is what family farms were really up this way. Early in the beginning, they were like fortresses, and where groups of families lived together, and they were protecting themselves and doing a little bit of farming and uh, seeking out an economy. But this is a good example of what I use for uh, students. And this was the family farm. And if you look at it, where are we right there? Watch who's it now. So what we're looking at is New England farming wasn't very successful. The soil was very rocky, you know, and we're forever pulling out farm, uh, rocks during the farming uh, uh, on the planting season. But this is the way it was back in the late 18, uh, uh, the early 1800s. It was clear cut. From what I'm told and what I have read, that you could stand on Mount Wachusett and actually see the ocean in Providence because of the clear cut. And as we know, His Majesty or Her Majesty was taking timber from this area for ships and building. Okay, so most of this uh, area was clear cut by the 1830s. Okay. So this is what we see. Farming was very meager in the early Blackstone Valley period. Then along about 1876, some of the merchants in Rhode Island wanted to take advantage of the hinterland of Massachusetts. They wanted to take advantage of all the canals that were being built in Europe. And they said this was the time to build a successful canal in central Massachusetts. Going from Providence, Rhode Island, Tidewater to Worcester at the time. Okay. Worcester at that time was a village. Later became the Shire Town. And the Shire Town is the courthouse. Nobody wanted to have any business with the courthouse except for criminals and deviants and everything like that. So nobody wanted to settle in the Shire Town. But the successful merchants in Providence were dealing with the China trade knew that if they could successfully tap the hinterland of Massachusetts, they could, they could eventually tap out to New York and points out west. And you start to think about that and you're going to say, hey, Ray, maybe your time frame's off over here. But people were thinking about building the Erie Canal. And in the early beginnings, that Businessmen in Worcester were thinking about running the Blackstone Canal up through Sterling, out through Western, uh, up through like the Route 2 area, Sterling area, and heading out to the Hoosac area out in Western Massachusetts, eventually hooking up to the Erie Canal. So people were forethinking about products being shipped from Port of Providence all the way out to the Western part of the uh, state and into the central, uh, at that time, central uh, United States. But this here is the Port of Providence. As you can see, merchant ships were coming in and out, and were dealing very successfully with the trade uh, in that area. Again, I don't know if you can see this. This is a little, it's a little tight to see, but this is, uh, just kind of clear that up. I don't know if you can, it's good, it's good for my eyes, I don't know about your eyes. But this here is all the watershed of Worcester. And I use this point to point out this area here, uh, which is uh, Indian Lake. Not a company's on the side of Indian Lake. Indian Lake drains into the Blackstone, which is Middle River coming through here. Blackstone over here. 
Mil I'm sorry, Millbrook. Middle River is coming on this side here. And this is Twin Sigmund Village right in that area. Okay? But this is all the watershed of Worcester. And if you travel Worcester today, just a little bit of uh, uh, knowledge for you. If you travel Worcester, all the water waterways of Worcester are buried. And hopefully in the next couple of years we're going to uncover this waterway and set these streams uh, free-flowing. Again, what I do for my students is use a lot of maps. Because what I'm finding out for those of you who are teachers, that we, we got away from uh, a lot of map reading. And a lot of students don't realize the importance of their local community maps. But if you look at this map, this is a map of 1776 in the center of Worcester. This here, I believe, is Lincoln Square. And right about here, I believe, is where uh, the DCU center is. Uh, I still refer as the Worcester uh, Centrum. You know, people look at me every time I say, well, the younger kids look at me, Centrum, and oh, it's the DCU center. But this is, this is an area that's uh, uh, very challenging. And you, can, you can't read this if, if the print is too small, but here. Yeah. But if you can take a look, this is where the, uh, uh, the boys club is. And WPI is off this way. Salisbury Pond is up this way. And if you look, this is the way the water flows right through here. You know, for those who uh, do a lot of map reading, you can understand that these little dots here represent swampland or wetlands in that area. Okay, so we're talking about Main Street, and I can't read that area right there. I can't remember what that area is. Okay. And then you're talking about Harney Street and Water Street down in this area here. But this map is readily available in, uh, in the Worcester Historical Museums. Again, if you take a look at the watershed in the area, you see that the drainage is coming all the way from Holden. Uh, Boylston, Shrewsbury area, and you know, right there, Auburn. And you've got the tunnel that I was talking to. A couple of gentlemen outside were discussing the old uh, tunnel out there for the flood control in that area. So you do have a history of the watershed in the Blackstone Valley. I'm not going to argue that. Uh, it's not my call. If it was my call, Auburn would have been included as far as... Uh, Attleboro on the other side too, on Attleboro, Massachusetts, which is still in the watershed too. But we're taking a look at the major drainage area in this area, coming up from uh, the North, the Millbrook, the Tannet Brook, Beaver Brook, and right into the Blackstone. So they're all flowing downward. All the water is coming off the hillsides and draining into the Blackstone. After the Erie Canal is built and completed, we see something that's very successful. And merchants in this area, primarily in uh, Rhode Island, sense that and they want to tap the interior of Massachusetts. This monument is actually up in Lowell, Massachusetts, but it's a tribute to the Irish Canal Billers. So what happened was the Irish laborers came off the Erie Canal and settled right here in Worcester because they knew the project was coming up. Now the Irish have a background of building canals for centuries in Europe. And they're pretty good at it too. They're a rowdy gang, believe it or not. Very rowdy, you know, and we won't talk about drinking, but part of the pay was four fingers of whiskey per day out in the field while they were digging. Now, primarily, you say, that's crazy. In our sense of knowledge, yeah, today it is crazy. But that was back-breaking work. It was hard. It was drudgery all day long. And that was an incentive for them to keep working. So that's why you have the, the, uh, the liquor flowing. You know? Then I could tell you all the stories about liquor, but we're going to relax on that. But the Irish did play a major part in this. They all, most of them came from the Erie Canal once it was built. They heard about this project being built in Central Mass, and they influxed right in here. Green Island in Worcester, how many are familiar with that? That's where a lot of them settled right in that area too, the island section. And if you still go down there today, you can see a resemblance of that too. 
off of Shrewsbury Street, Shamrock Street. So you still, you know, as you travel along, you can still see uh, signs of our past, too, being a historical society. You know, should, you should really be aware of it, too. This is uh, uh, 1832 version of uh, the map of Worcester Center. As you can see, that is the basin, Thomas Street. Okay. What was the old building there, the old Prime Value map? Does everybody remember that one? Yeah, I talked to students today, Prime Value map, and I have to sit back and say, oh, yeah, Taco Bell or whatever is over there now. But right in the section was the old Prime Value, excuse me, the Prime Value map. It flowed downward towards Green Island and this, this area here, southward. This street here, Blackstone Street, no longer there. The hospital took up that side of the area too. Okay, one of the best things that happened during the Blackstone Canal was the anticipation of more business. Main Street, Worcester, 1820, 1832 I believe, I can't, can't find out a date on that. But we'll go with 1832. The first public works project in the center of Worcester was right here, building of sidewalks. Okay. Now, 1828, the canal opened. One mile either side of this canal. Okay. The value of property increased over 500%. Think about it. Outwards after that, about 100%. Farmers were anticipating more business. They planted more crops. Okay, as far as Auburn, Sturbridge, Brookfields, and everything, everybody was anticipating this. So everybody was gearing up for this. This was like the new Renaissance of Worcester. Worcester was going places now because of this canal. Okay, so we have the population starting to increase in this area. You find out you're going to have shops opening up, taverns opening up, brickyards opening up, boatyards opening up. Everything's starting to business, is starting to flourish. If you really look back and you really dig into history, a lot of the uh, land in here were owned by women too. So if you really go back, you can see the plots in there too, which was kind of unusual in that day. This is the Thomas Street Basin. This was a wood carving, and it was used for a hat company as a, a promotion type thing. But if you look at it, there's a canal boat right here. And like I, what I like to say to my students, uh, here's the laborers unloading this barge. And these two people, the husband and the wife, own a business. They're supervising their goods coming off the, the barge or onto the barge. And they want to make sure everything's done well. But this is an area where the boat was turned around physically and could head back down at Thomas Street Basin, like I said before, which is right there. So there was a lot of commerce going on during that time. We know this because there's a lot of primary resource uh, available to us. And this is here, is a journal uh, from a canal corporation. And if you look at it, it says 18 something, I can't see the end. Uh, but this documents the whole uh, canal process for that, that time period, that day. And you can find this in the Worcester Historical Society and also in the Rhode Island Historical Society which holds a lot of primary information. Primary information is first-hand information. Stuff we, uh, items that we have uh, uh, first-hand available. Secondary is like stories that we have uh, from people and newspaper articles too. But we have a lot of primary uh, documentation. Of course, we see this primary information in some of the newspapers too. And as you can see, departing from Worcester, Massachusetts on Friday, April 24th, the year is unknown, but you know we probably have it in our records. This is the boat, Rhode Island, cards to Providence and machinery to Ohio. Monday, the Governor Lincoln, wood. Tuesday, the packet, wood socket, wood. The packet, Millbury to uh, lumber to Millbury, and the packet, uh, Lincoln, apples, hay, boots, and shoes. So if you look in the Worcester Historical Society, and the Worcester Library, you can find this information in the Massachusetts Spy. And this is documentation that Worcester was actual seaport on the uh, trade routes. Okay. So it's primarily important. Typically, this is the type of uh, boat that navigated the canal. 
This is up on the Middlesex Canal. I was fortunate to go up there a couple of years ago uh, with my family. My daughter was an ice skater, and she, we had to go up to a professional uh, skate fitter up there. And I came across this boat. I knew the Middlesex Canal, so I wanted to go down and take a photograph of it. But if you look at it, stern to bow, probably about 90 feet long. The width, probably about uh, probably about nine feet wide. Very skinny, very tall bolts. They could probably haul about 50 tons of freight. Very shallow, okay? Very, very shallow. But we're actually going to start looking at the root of the uh, canal right now from Worcester. And this is where I'm going to get into the meat of the program. This is behind Union Station. If you can see the church spire up here, that's St. John's Church, okay? Now, at this time period, you got to realize that the Irish were not allowed to go into Worcester Center proper. This was the gate. They couldn't go beyond this. They lived, if you realize it, off Shrewsbury Street. And how you know this is because there are a couple of streets of Irish names on them. Uh, Shamrock Street's one of them, up in back of uh, the, the school up there on Shrewsbury Street. But if you look, off to my left, if you really visualize yourself going down in back of the the centrum and the parking garages that we're going to be tearing down in Worcester. Uh, the Korean War conflict memorial is off to the left-hand side. You don't see it on the photograph, but you'll have to visualize that. Union Station is over here, and right through there, this viaduct here, this is the, uh, the railroad, the province of Worcester Railroad. That is the viaduct right there that goes right through here down Harding Street, okay? So this is where we are. Does everybody visualize where I am? No. Okay. Anytime you want to stop me, just yell out, and I'll clarify something. So what we're doing is we're traveling down Harding Street now, which the Heritage Corridor, the city of Worcester wants to open up as a uh, canal district. You've probably seen a lot about it in the paper uh, in the last couple of years. But if you look at it, the canal is buried right below this area. And how do I know that? Because over the last 10 years that I've been researching the canal, it's easier to build a canal in a straight line. So the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Here's your straight line right down Harding Street. If you don't believe me, go drive it tomorrow. Water Street's up here. And hopefully in the next couple of years, this may be all waterized. But take a look at it. If you go farther down, that's Holy Cross, way down there. Crompton Park, Holy Cross area. But this is the way the canal boats travel out of Worcester on its way down to uh, Rhode Island. This is going down to Quinsigaman Village. If you remember, all this is gone right now. But if you remember a couple of years ago, there was an OK Willing Mill off to the side here. I think they were famous for baby clothes. I remember going when my, my daughter's 22 years old. We used to go there to buy baby clothes, but also it was, uh, they made siding at the, at the place, aluminum siding. Uh, originally, I don't know if anybody uh, has ever worked there, but this was part of the, the South Works, the Wyman Garden, uh, uh, Washburn and Moore plant. They used to have, this is one of their wire drawing mills off to the side, and this is their area, their area over on that side. <coughs> Excuse me. But this area has all been uh, knocked down now, and it's the new highway coming through there. But if you look, this is the middle river coming off from Holy Cross. And right over here, there's a culvert, which is going underneath the ground right there. And that is the Mill Brook. This is Middle River, and right there is where the Blackstone River begins. Okay. Now the canal comes off this side, it flows right through here, and there was a, used to be a lock there. There are no remnants of that lock left. This shows you that the river is through there. You can see it in the blue the area. But here's Quinn Sigamon Village. And this, I believe, is, uh, uh, I, I wanted to say 290, but I want to say 146 now. Coming out. I, I will say 146. But all this has been, uh, redone over the last year or two. So the new highway is coming through there. All this is gone. The old Southworks has all been demolished and everything. 
But the canal, the canal came out of here. Here's the fire station. Come out of here and went directly through the South Works and uh, worked its way down through the valley. Again, how I know that is because I get out and I actually did some photography. This is behind what is called the Heritage Storage Plant on the old 146 route. You can walk back there in the uh, fall time after all the foliage is left. You can see this here. This is actually the only remnants left of the Blackstone Canal in Worcester proper. 32 feet across, it's in a straight line. Right here is the old towpath, and that's where the horses used to walk pulling the barges. That is still there. That's part of the new Heritage State Park, which uh, the state of Massachusetts, the federal government, and the Park Service have invested in, and will make a visitor center there within the next couple of years. That is still there. If you walk the new bike path, you can actually see this if you walk up and overlook into the, the little valley. This is a little bit shaky here, because you can see we're on a slant. Well, actually, I did the photography. I was slipping at the same time. I didn't want to go in the river. Here's the canal, 32 feet across. It's been measured, I measured it. Towpath is right here, overgrown, but it's still there. Another shot looking northwards towards Worcester. Here's the canal, 32 feet across. Towpath is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking southward. Towpath is right there, okay? That's where the horses travel along, pulling these barges. Like I said, 90 feet long, 9.5 feet wide, can hold about 50 tons of freight. Unfortunately, Chuck Arney, who does our video production, both Chuck and I were out earlier last year looking for this site, and this site has been demolished <laughs> with the new uh, highway construction. I was pretty upset about it when I first found, found out it was demolished, but I rationalized with myself, we can't save everything in history. What we want to do is save our best pot, so I kind of like left it at like that. But if you looked at this, this is looking northwards towards Worcester. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you kind of like look right here, you see the old guardrail. This is when the old 146 was there. You could kind of like get on the on ramp to Route 20. If you remember, looking over Route 20, Shabbat Motors was used to be there. Remember those days when you get on Route 20 there, you know, on 46? It's long ago, but actually, this is the old dry bed of the canal that was there. It was still buried in the forest 125 years later, 32 feet across, was a prism shape. Downward, flat, and upward. There was the canal. And then this was, I had people down there, and we talked about it, and everybody says, I have no idea. Is this a cat road? I said, look at it. We looked facing northward, and then I said, turn around. And we looked. This is the view turning around. Here's the old Route 20 bridge many years ago. Prism. Sloped down, flat across, sloped upward. This is called reading the landscape. So you have to put your mind, your historic mind out, and you have to start visualizing but you can actually see the canal here. And a lot of the times what I do with my students is talking about reading landscape. Reading landscapes are not, but once I show you how to read the landscape, you can see history, maybe 200 years past, but you can see what is there. And this is what is there, the old canal bed. That's the bed. Right here is the Blackstone River, and right there, there was a wooden guard lock. God, it wasn't a lot that you could lift gate, but it was a lot where the water could flow into the canal, not flow out of the canal. Similar, similar to a lock, but a lock raises and lowers, okay? But that's called a guard lock, okay? That's all been destroyed. It's not there. I think this is the only remaining photographs of it. Taken a number of years ago, if you come out there, this is 146 off uh, here, right here. Here's the canal. And again, this was taken in autumn. Here's the towpath. And after a while, after I train, you're going to be able to see this. But this has all been destroyed with the new highway project. <clears throat> what happened 
after the canal went bankrupt in 1848, the railroad bought most of this area up. For some reason, they didn't need this property. And in the early 20s and 40s after World War II, uh, what happened was that the telephone company bought the rights to this property, and they said, this is a perfect way to, to lay line now. It's flat, it's even. So they did their telephone line right on the towpath where the horses pulled the boats. Like I said, this is below where the old Shabbat Motors was. But from there, if we're heading southward after Route 20, it crossed over to Millbury. There used to be an old shell station on 146, if everybody can remember that. I don't know if you can, but bear with me. It went right through that property, and it headed like in a, a southeasterly direction. And if you drive by there today, coming off the exit ramp that's for the new Blackstone Valley Malls, and if you come off 146 heading northward, and you took a right going into Millbury, and if you look right, in a couple of more months, you'll be able to, well, next month, you'll be able to see this. And off to your right is the old Blackstone Canal. It's still visible. It's a dry trench, but all these houses are built on it right here. Here's the slope. You got a little bit of the canal and the slope on the other side. You know, progress means that some of the area has been destructed. This is going downward a little bit farther towards the Millbury Center. Here's the slope, the flat land, there's the slope. All over ground, but the canal is still there. Still visible today, if you wanted a treasure now. I don't know if uh, anybody knows this gentleman. He passed away a, a good uh, seven or eight years ago, but he was a, a very good friend of mine, Bob White out of Millbury. He dealt with the Millbury Bank. Uh, he called me up one week and said, hey, Ray, the water subsided, it's dry. He says, I think we got to go out and start exploring the canal. At this time, this man was 79 years old. And at that time, I was probably uh, 47, 48. We hiked a good 20 miles all through Millbury and, and everything. <clears throat> we used a topographical map to find a canal. We went out and we looked at this area. It was a dry area. We found this stone. As you can see, Bob is measuring this stone and looking at it, and uh, we're trying to determine the site of an old canal lock. Because over the years, over the hundred or so odd years, there's been a lot of floods and hurricanes that come up through this area, tornadoes. The landscape has changed quite a bit. Uh, this area, and because of the bankruptcy in the canal, uh, all the uh, canal blocks were so locked. But with the measurement of this site, and determining that the size of the stone we found the, the exact remnants of where the canal lock was in Millbrook. It was behind the electrical uh, uh, training center. Down farther when we went down, this is another thing we found. And if we looked at it, you know, you don't really see too much. But as a historian, I see quite a bit in this photograph. I see the water running through it. I see the slope of the canal. But also because of the water running through it, I see a, a, a sense of elevation changing. But I see one particular th item in there that really sparked my interest. Right there. Believe it or not, that's an old canal lock block that was cut by Italian stonemasons. Why that wasn't carried away and put on somebody's front door, I have no idea. But that's what it would look like. This is a lock down in Millbury, Millbury, Mass, down towards the Rhode Island line that's still intact. Again, when you take a look at the canal during that period, we're leaving from farm and we're moving into our factories. The, the manufacturing economy is starting to kick in in the United States. But in turn, people realize that jobs are still scarce and people who have good jobs, namely this young man here, this woman is courting him, so he, she knows that he has a good job on the canal and is a steady income. Lo and behold, as she doesn't realize one thing, that in another 10 years, there's something coming down the road which, which makes this canal obsolete, which is? Correct. That's what it is. The railroads. Before the first 
shovel full of dirt was overturned, overturned, the Blackstone Canal was obsolete. Again, this is uh, what you call a hoagie. He was the guy who, who handled the horses. And we use horses here in the Blackstone Valley because this is English country. And New York, they use mules because that was Dutch country. Okay, so we towed our barges with horses. And this was actually taken in Syracuse, New York. Again, what you see typically is when we're approaching a lot, as simulated here with a Joshua White, we have a lock, which is here, the lock tender, who in the Blackstone Valley was usually a farmer. And when they would pull the horse, the, the, the canal barge, up the river or down the river, wherever which way it was going, the captain had to signal the lock tender. And the only way I can say this is that if you remember the football games where we had those black, uh, the big long horns, in my days they were plastic, and you used to boop. This is the way they used to do it. And the lock tender would come down, collect the toll, and actually open the lock. So you could pull your boat in, lock the gate behind you, and raise the water. Now the only way I can say this is like a bathtub where you pull a plug, the water goes down like this, and you go down, or if you're putting the plug in, you raise whatever's in the tub upward. That's the way uh, uh, the locks work. But in the 1820 and 1830 mindset, that was simulated as the Superman ride out in uh, Agawam. It was, uh, it was a thrill to them as us going on that Six Flag uh, ride out there. So this is what happens. The lock, we go into the lock. The lock shut behind us. The water is raised. We go through. This is, uh, of course, on the CNO Canal up in uh, Washington. And once the water is elevated to the, to the height of the river, the gates are open, and we continue downstream. Of course, this is simulated again. We don't have no actual photographs of canal boats on the Blackstone Canal. But this is actual towpath coming out of Millbury, again on our journey down. If beneath hitting in the forest at Millbury, you can see the towpath is still there. It's used as a running path. During the canal period, this was all day, but there's the canal right over on your left hand side. Farther down, here's the Blackstone River. Here's the old towpath right here and the silt is built up around here. But this is the back of the electrical company down in Millbury, if anybody is familiar with that area. This is still visible in the woods if you uh, really hiked it. Any clue? It says 37. See it? 37. Rocks around it. That's the mile marker that is hidden in the woods. That gentleman I introduced you to before, Bob White, when we were hiking, we found this stone, the 37 mile marker from Providence. And we turned around and we said to each other, we should protect it. So what we did is just build a little stone and, and, and palm it around it and cover it up. And it's still there today. So we're, I was with uh, uh, a couple of people earlier this year. We actually stopped at this market when we were kayaking and I brought them in. And, uh, Took a look at it, it's still there. This is the old uh, canal, it looks like an old uh, lock site, which the uh, Blackstone Canal Company uh, sold off to uh, recoup some of the values. But if you look at the, uh, the canal, it was really a failure from the beginning. It was unlike the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal you know, could operate a good portion of the year, but here we had some problems. Spring freshets right after winter, with all the snow runoff. This is the old electrical power dam in Millbury, just beyond Getty's, uh, Goretti's uh, supermarket. It's about a half mile down on the river. And this is an old breach dam here. So this is what we were faced with in the springtime, a lot of high water. So what happened? Your boats were stalled. You couldn't move your goods up and down river because there was too much water in the river. It's another shot of it, too looking off there. The canal went right alongside this area too. A lot of water, your boats were held up. It wasn't profitable. In winter, what happened? 
Frieza. You're right. This is the old canal down in uh, Uxbridge, Massachusetts that's still watered, and it freezes during the winter time. 32 feet across, towpath right over here. What happened in summer? Dried up. Yeah. Yeah. Very profitable industry, right? Again, if you look, this is a shot looking southward from uh, what was called uh, Lookout Rock. Canal came out of the woods right over here and ran the side of the bank right here, right down here. And this is where the Exbridge State Park is, right in that area. Here. Believe it or not, that area right there is the same way it was back in the 1820s. So we do have a nice preservation site in, uh, in the valley there. We do a lot of kayak and canoeing out there. Bird watching is uh, really phenomenal about out there. A lot of you people who duck hunt, a lot of ducks on this uh, during the fly season. Of course, it's a nice shot during you know, the fall time, too. This is just to simulate uh, the boats on the canal. This happens to be on the Erie Canal. It's a motorized boat. But here's a towpath right there, similar to what was on the uh, uh, Blackstone Valley. Very nice shot. If you look in the archives, you do, up in New York, you do have a lot of photographs up there. That's a lot that's still in existence in Millville, Massachusetts. What's wrong with this, sh uh, this lock here is the gates are missing on either down there and right here on these two sides. And right about there, because of the frost heaves in the trees, there's a couple of blocks out of shape. This lock is a doable site where you could turn around and reconstruct this site. Somewhere a project would be doable with maybe Reasonable Polytech out of New York, a WPI, uh, putting their freshman students to use and using the tools of the 1820 period. I think that would be an excellent project for uh, future engineers to take on. But it's still there. It's, it's in the woods. And it's just by sheer neglect that this survived. You know, actually there's no damage, no graffiti to the lock or anything. So we think the lock gates are in here. This is facing northward, by the way. Too. This is another angle. This is a group of students I worked with a number of years ago on a Sullivan Middle School in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. Instructor uh, teacher Beth Harding, we went to graduate school together, and I had her class out there. So you can see that this lock is nine and a half feet wide. It's about 90 feet wide, and Beth is probably about five feet. So you can see there's a little bit of depth there. This is looking southward, okay? So the boats would travel into the lock, the gates were shut, and they would continue down there. This is still, like I said, still there. Again, if you took a look, Robert Milnick, who was a historian, or is still a historian, he says that uh, people drive by places that are important to history every day and never realize that they're doing it. This is a road in uh, Whitensville. And this is one street up above uh, Route 16. Uh, it's called Church Street. And the area is called Plumber's Landing. But if you look at it, and if you really look at it really closely, right there and right there, that's actually the old canal lock. Remember a couple of years ago when uh, Senator Amarello went into uh, Mass Highway and uh, the bridges were falling down in Fall River, Massachusetts and a couple other places? Well, here we have a bridge that's on the abutments of almost a 170-year-old bridge. And look at that bridge. Now, that's, uh, that's not too modern, but it's enough to support <laughs> truck traffic and car traffic every day, and people pass over this and they don't even know they're passing over the Blackstone Canal. So, there's a lot of history to be learned up there, but still that's a, a, a tribute to engineering too. This is a shot down in Lower Rhode Island, and there's the old towpath there. What happened was that after the canal went bankrupt, they built this boardwalk on there. And in Rhode Island, after 1848, the canal was still in operation because it was serving the canal towns. But up here we used more of the uh, horses and wagons to pull uh, freight down, and we used to use the 
the old PNW Railroad, which was an all-weather vehicle that could travel all year long through snow, through ice, through drought. So it was more profitable. When this opened up, when the Blackstone Canal opened up, the women of this mill here were all out waving their handkerchiefs because they were cheering. And if you look back, you know, this is a good point to say this, but if you look back uh, when the canal was built, it was very prosperous to this area. When the canal in 1828 came into Worcester, the Lady Carrington traveled up on a two-day journey, was met by cannon fire, brass bands, and it was a real hoopla in the city. Because this meant that Worcester was now co connected, or Worcester County was now connected to the world. So it was a very, very, uh, a very important economic uh, uh, building. If you look, again, where are we? Wachusett Mounting, this is the Worcester Center Profit. Uh, Providence Street, uh, what's that, Worcester Academy up that way? Yeah. All right, Worcester Academy's here, we're looking down. There's the Blackstone Canal, Water Street area down that way. And I'm told that this is the old Grafton Street going down into the city. And as you can see, in the early days of the canal, Worcester was centralized more in the center of the city where the courthouse is, where the Worcester Centrum is. And when the canal started to prosper a couple of more years, progress started to come in, more factories started to come in. More immigrants started to come in, so Whistler started to expand and went up to Providence Hill and out that way. And eventually, probably your forefathers, your great grandfathers, and beyond that, uh, worked in the factories of Worcester as they became more prosperous, headed out to Auburn, Oxford, and Paxton, and, and everything. Again, if you take a look at this, any idea? What is it? Grafton Hill. What's up on Grafton Hill? Three decades. Oh, yeah, three decades. Where are we here? Worcester Academy. You realize that Worcester Academy during the Civil War was a hospital? It was. Yeah. But you can see, as the progress of the canal, industry started boom, booming because of the canal. More goods actually came up the canal that went down the canal, believe it or not. But Worcester started to prosper. I look at Worcester as the canal, the Blackstone Canal, was the spot, but the railroad was actually the dynamite that really set this uh, economic expansion in central Massachusetts afire. What happens is we talked about the railroad and we talked about the canal. Uh, the railroad was a more efficient ways of transporting goods people and everything. Don't feel sorry for the people who invested in the canal that you think lost their insurance. They lost a little bit of money, but they were very quick to invest in the railroad, so they didn't, uh, they didn't lose too much. And that's what happened down in Rhode Island. A lot of factories built up. The railroads enabled the goods to come up to Worcester. If you look at Worcester, if you look at the surrounding area, there's a lot of factories still in Worcester. Worcester is the largest manufacturing city not located on a navigable river. A navigable river is like Hudson River. We couldn't navigate frigates or ships up here. But Worcester was primarily one of the strongest industrial centers in the world at one time. Textiles, machinery, steel, barbed wire, shoes, automobiles, bicycles, ice skates, you name it. It was made all around this area. Worcester played a very important role in the Industrial Revolution. And that's why we're here at the, with the National Park Service. <clears throat> I started to lose my voice, excuse me. But this is a shot looking towards Providence. This is Lincoln, Rhode Island off 146. And if you really get up into an aircraft, you start looking around instead of fooling around with maps, you can see something very different. And what I always say is reading the landscape. Here is the Blackstone River. That is the 116 Viaga. This is Lonsdale, which is a mill village. Now, if I asked you where the canal was, where would you say? Here? Over here? Or here? It's there. See it? 
straight line right into the river. See it bends right over there. Okay. But a lot of this material, a lot of this canal is still visible. You have to do a lot of hiking. But with the new bike path down in Rhode Island, the bike path is right adjacent to the canal. So you can actually walk or ride a bike, a skateboard, or roller skate of your choice if you want to do that. But again, there's a lot of stories that are told here. In Uxbridge, Massachusetts, if you walk some of the trails in the background, you see evidence of old stone cutters. And that is actually a, a butterfly wedge, which the stone cutter was trying to break this block with an, uh, a, uh, a hammer, a steel rod, which was had a star drill, we call it. You would force it into the rock. The guy would hit it. Another guy would turn it. The guy would hit it and turn it. And you pray that the guy wasn't drinking that day. Otherwise, you get whacked in the head. And after you got it in so far, you put in the butterfly wedge, and we just split the rock. For some reason, this rock was left the way it was. And this is about 200 yards from a, a lock, a uh, granite block that was harvested in the area, quarried in the area. But for some reason, this stone kind of gave up this rock. But the evidence is still there. Today, what we do see is a lot of evidence of recreation, both in the Blackstone Canal and on the watershed. We have a, a rejuvenation of recreation. For the past five years, I've been involved with kayaking and canoeing, and I have taken, on any given night during May to August, roughly about 80 to 85 people on the river of all ages, from teenagers up to people who are in their mid-80s, okay? So we enjoy this recreation of uh, kayaking and rejuvenation. A lot of people are getting into it. So we, we do see uh, a revitalization in the Blackstone Valley. And again, a lot of people are out there walking the old toll paths. As you can see, this is in Uxbridge. Canal is over here. It's a little overgrown, but a lot of the tow paths are still there. A lot of people are bike, biking now. This is a good friend of mine from uh, Winsocket. Uh, uh, I forgot his last name right now, but uh, he bicycles from Worcester to Providence at least once or twice a month. And he's in his, uh, when this photograph was taken, he was in his late uh, 70s. Another evidence, this is in the center of Woonsocket, where we have a canal lock buried. And uh, we went in and we looked at it. There's the wall. It's open. We measured it up. We have archaeologists in there. And we decided to cover it back up because there's a lot of people who are wandering around at nighttime doing different things. And we didn't want them to fall in the canal lock. So it's buried. Maybe in the future generations they'll make this a, a state park or something. But well, we do have a lot of canal locks still buried into the system. And then another way to travel this old Blackstone Canal and to learn about history is the Blackstone Valley Explorer. It's a 48-passenger boat, handicapped equipped. It has a bathroom on it. It's crewed by a Coast Guard license three crew a team. Uh, it serves as an educational platform. Any idea what this is? It's up off Tadnick Square. Oh, it's off Cataract Street. Okay, this is some of the water, the headwaters of the Blackstone that's coming off the Holden Plateau up there. Okay, it's about a 100 foot drop. This is probably some of the cleanest water in this area. Coming off, going through Coles Pond, flowing into the Blackstone. But it, I show my students this because this is the headwaters of the Blackstone. And again, if you look at the Blackstone Canal and if you're traveling around, Law. <clears throat> Excuse me. The way you can identify this is, like I said before, in a straight line, shortest distance between two points. A lot of people, I try to say, tell me where this is, and I'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes playing around talking to them. I won't do that to you, but this is actually uh, Syracuse, New York. This is the old canal, uh, Erie Canal up there. Similar to Harding Street, this photograph I showed you in the beginning. Straight line, shortest distance between two points. A couple of years ago, this was on the expedition that we did. Some of the Blackstone River down farther, it's uh, uh, very wide. Again, the Hoagie and his uh, uh, 
mule up in New York. He was the team leader on the uh, canal. One of the great places to learn about this area is the Worcester Historical Museum. And this is the exhibit in their Institute of uh, Worcester's uh, uh, industry. It's a good, uh, I think it's called the uh, In Your Shirt Sleeves. It talks about a lot of the industries of Worcester County. Uh, mostly, probably a lot of you people have worked for the Wyman Gardens, the, uh, you know, all the other big uh, heavy industries, the Nortons, and uh, has a lot of good history about the area. Also, it's a good place to go for research. So if you're looking for Auburn history, this is another area uh, that you can do your research on. They're very good over there, very friendly. It's a good place to, uh, their library is very friendly, easy to use, people are really uh, helping you. And again, we go back to the major tributaries of uh, the Blackstone, Quinn Sigmund River, the Mumford River, and the Millbrook, and all the others that are flowing from this area. But if you look at it, we now have a lot of people out there recreating. Not only people, but dogs like it too. <laughs> so we do have a lot of different people out there and creatures uh, kayaking with us every week uh, during the, blast, uh, the summer season. Oh, yeah, I guess we're all done. So I want to... <laughs> thank you. <laughs> It's been a long day. I start, I start work at 6 in the morning, so it's a very long day for me. But, you know, if this is an exciting place to live because there's a lot of history here. And not only is there a lot of history in uh, American industry and Underground Railroad and not only the Blackstone Canal. Uh, so wherever you turn, there's a lot of history. And uh, if you ever get a chance to take a trip with us out in the Blackstone Valley, I welcome you to do it. Well, I want to thank you for letting me talk, and uh, any questions, just let me know. It's nice to see you don't have the pool or anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're talking before. I did, I did have a comment. Uh, my wife, my grandson, and I went up to Lowell, and they have a working, uh, uh, I can't say the word now. The boats? Okay. Yeah, but they or actually lock? have a lock, a working right. lock that we went through in the boat, and they, they raised and lowered it. Right. right. That, you know, unfortunately, we lost Mike Creasy, who was our executive director. Now he's director or superintendent up at Lowell. Mike was a really nice guy, a really good friend. And Lowell, Massachusetts, is probably uh, the best site to go around this area to go take a, a ride on a canal boat. And getting up through the lock and experience that and going out onto the uh, Merrimack River. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray.